And just to kill you isn't enough for him. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Underrated Podcast. This is a podcast where we discuss films that we think are underrated, underappreciated, or ones that have slipped under the radar and passed most people by. Uh, We are the Undercast Company, made up of myself, Derek McDuff, as well as my co-host, Ariel Ortiz. Hello. And Alan Torres. Hey, what's up, everybody? We are in the middle of a mini-series that we're doing focusing on underrated or forgotten films from before the 1970s, and today we're going to be taking at a look at uh, some what of a cult classic, a little brother, if you will, of Psycho and a proto-slasher. Uh, this was Alan's pick, and that is 1960's Peeping Tom. Uh, so Alan, uh, why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about this movie? Oh, yeah. And first off, I wanted to give a shout out. Uh, There's actually a recommendation by one of our listeners on the Discord. Uh, He reminded me of it, and I was like, oh, my God, yes, I got to do it. Uh, It's one of your buddies, right, Derek? Yeah, yeah, my buddy Damien is one of our patrons over there on Discord, so we always appreciate that. Big shout out. Thank you so much, Damien. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that like as soon as I read that, I was like, oh, my God, yep, that's my pick instantaneously. (laughs) But yeah, so Peeping Tom, it's a 1960s psychological horror thriller proto slasher like uh, Derek was saying directed by Michael Powell and then starring Carl Bohm and Moira Shearer yeah so came back back in the day the plot of the film is pretty much this dude he's a uh, peeping Tom voyeurism whatever you want to call it and he likes to murder women and like he uses a camera uh, he films them and he kills them with the tripod there's a blade at the end of the tripod and there's a little bit more to it around the end of the film where you find out that he's actually also making his victims see themselves die. He puts like a little mirror on the camera uh, just because he needs to see them frightened because of the things that happened to him in his youth. His dad was a scientist, but kind of like a huge dick and just completely <laughs> traumatized uh, the character Mark, our main, uh, our main character. We follow around and we see him do these things, but yeah, uh, I want to hear what you guys thought. Um, I, I had seen clips of it a long time ago, and then I remember seeing it on like Bravo's Top 100 Scariest Movie Moments. And I remember I had put that on my watch list for the longest time, and, I, and I'm fucking super happy I finally got, got, to jump, got the chance to jump right into it. So yeah, what did you guys think? I think it definitely when you, when you say with you saying the um like kind of like the brother to psycho i i definitely get that because it did feel very much like is a very weird movie uh interesting movie <laughs> it does kind of like it does have that feel of like a which it kind of takes place in, in a british kind of time where in the mod era which is kind of like what like the who came out of and and all those kind of things of that kind of style and you get that that um kind of style from Mark himself, and then also with the with the um kind of random dance number in the middle by by one of his victims, very modish in its way. But yeah, now now hearing that that kind of idea of it being a kind of companion to Psycho, I definitely get that. It is that kind of like psychological character of like a very awkward but charming kind of guy. Definitely like something that that nowadays, you know, you would be more aware and hesitant of like interacting with. And I I did and not really brush off like a lot of people in this movie kind of brush that off, even making comments of like, you know, you're weird. Um, (laughs) And I am kind of threatened by you, but I'm not kind of thing. It's just very random. It's a very weird um concept of a of a movie of, of, like of this peeping tom but it was it was definitely interesting to kind of like have this kind of background of a story of of the father somewhat kind of morphing and and creating him as a peeping tom in a way it's kind of like the the father himself kind of had voyeurist voyeurism kind of tendencies mm-hmm. but in a slightly different way very much so just for his son and uh 
in a very weird like yeah like it's kind of like if if psychology went wrong in a way and i feel like like that's where his whole um i don't want to say manifesto but his whole goal of his of his film kind of like came from like essentially finishing what his father started in a way but yeah definitely a weird interesting movie I think like having like following this this character himself it makes gives you a feel of like being a voyeurist yourself as as well. So that was like kind of like an interesting um feeling to have while watching a movie. So yeah. Yeah, no, I I completely agree with all that Ariel. This is actually a movie that I wasn't even aware of until uh, Damien suggested it, and then you know I looked it up, and obviously you know I kind of brought up that it was uh, it has been kind of compared a lot to Psycho. They came out the same year, both deal with somewhat of the similar themes of like this guy who's this introvert that is kind of has this tortured past that came out of being you know kind of uh, tortured by their parents or like abused psychologically by their parents and. And I think, you know, obviously over the years, Psycho has been the one that's been remembered, whereas this is more of a cult film. And at the time, it you know, it was a lot of people were very opposed, like, oh, there's all this, you know, stuff about sex and violence and all this stuff. And it came out in the era that I talked about before of the Hayes Code, although the Hayes Code was starting to become less and less prevalent. Filmmakers were starting to ignore it and really push the envelope with what they could do. And I think this is one of those films that really like was like, okay, we're going to technically be in the letter of the law of this code, but we're really going to push the boundaries. And I think that audiences of the time and critics of the time as well, just kind of missed the boat. And it has had a real major reappraisal in a lot of ways because this film feels like it came out in the eighties or the nineties. Like it feels so ahead of its time with just the way it's shot and the themes and all of that stuff, the psychological profile of this guy, because you are like, wow, you can, on one hand, you feel sorry for him, but he's also like murdering women, and you're like, oh, he's a monster, but you feel for him, and you get kind of caught up in his kind of love interest. You're like, oh man, I want to like you, but are you horrible? And I, I really loved all of that stuff. Just all the stuff with the camera, I felt like too, was really, really ahead of its time. How he's like, oh, I have to kid capture everything and record everything and he's going everywhere with his camera and now that's what everyone fucking does everyone goes and has to record everything and take pictures of everything and we can't just experience things out in the world and this was before like any of that was a thing like it's amazing to me that this came out in 1960 because it feels like it is directly commenting on the things we are dealing with today and him as a character he feels just like someone that would be in like a David Fincher movie or like, you know, a Silence of the Lambs movie. Like he'd be one of the ones that Clarice is coming after or something like that. And so, yeah, I I was really, really drawn into it. Like I said, it amazed me that this is from this time period. And the performances, I thought, were all really great. Um, I think that his dedication to like, oh, I've got to make the perfect film and all of this stuff. And this is this documentary I was making almost served as like maybe a commentary about some of the directors at the time, which were notably these assholes who would just like kind of like just use and discard their their stars and not really care about who they were hurting just so that they could get the perfect film. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but it was something I definitely read a lot into it and I know The Shining wouldn't come out till years later but you know Kubrick was making films at this time Hitchcock was making films at this time you have these directors who are just so taxing on their stars and they are kind of almost sociopathic in the way that this guy was and it's like oh it's it's all for the greater good of making my great movie or my great documentary and I don't care who I hurt or anything so yeah this this really really had a big impact on me and it's something that I, I want to go back to and revisit for sure. Yeah. I, I don't, I have to disagree with you that, that it feels like it, there ha were a lot of movies at the time that, that had this kind of energy. Um, I would say, um, and that kind of like, like I said, the mod kind of, um, film era 
um, definitely had that kind of things. Like I, like I had um, texted you guys about of um, Willy Wonka, the Willy Wonka and Chocolate Factory, which it takes place during this about about time in the sixties. Not really when the f- filming was done, but it takes place during about this time of that kind of mod era of of England and um, this. Kind yeah, of but like, that came out in the seventies. A lot of those films, but I, feel I like just said came that it, it. I said yeah. it, it takes place in the sixties, though. I know that's what I'm saying, though. Like this, this came out during that time period. Like came out actually in that time. Oh, because you said that it feels more like an eighties movie. And like I'm an, saying yeah, that, well, oh no, okay, it feels okay, like or seventies or eighties. But yeah, it definitely feels at least ten years ahead of its time. Yeah, I'm just trying to like, like call out like that that mod era of of movie telling that that does go get swept under the rug. Like a lot of the mod mm-hmm. kind of culture, you know, outside of the Who, has gotten hit. But it is that kind of like idea of like a somewhat somewhat counterculture of of an era in this time. And I guess I, that's definitely like where this movie existed in. I mean, um, and I'm sure that that's where like culture kind of thing and it also probably it being a more british film kept it oh as you know limited its its distribution in mm-hmm. a way as well that kind of um contributed to it but um but yeah definitely like um i i think it for me the mark character was just very much of like a stunted kind of unremorsed guy I didn't really feel too much sympathy for him just because like he just is a stunted person that doesn't know anybody. He's a, you know, he's a psychopath. And like, I think that the way that this movie and psycho particularly differ is because you get that, that twist and that turn of, of Norman Bates, like as the last thing. So up until that point, you have a very sympathetic kind of character. Whereas this is like, okay, his crime is presented like in the forefront. So his ability, your, the audience's ability to feel sympathy might have been like kind of stunted in that direction in a bit, but, but definitely, yeah, like you're saying, like feels like a, a Alfred Hitchcock or a Kubrick movie. And I think maybe just the notoriety led that that those directors and writers kind of filmmakers kind of gain cause this this one to kind of be a bit more cultish in flavor yeah i mean before sorry i know you got to talk alan but before you, i get to you I, I do think you bring up a good point about you know those guys this was the era when people started lifting up these quote-unquote auteurs so it's like oh this is where the french auteur theory came out They're like okay well here's a kubrick Here's, you know, a a Hitchcock. These are these great filmmakers. And if you're not one of those guys, even if you make a masterpiece, you're not going to get remembered. And also, you know, I I think you bring up a really good point about the mod culture. Um, Something I didn't really think of uh, is that, yeah, this movie is a British film. And British films were kind of ahead of American films. And in what they were saying, in the way they were pushing the envelope. And you wouldn't see, like you said, up until like the 70s and stuff with the Willy Wonkas, these kind of like not exactly counterculture films, but films that are really trying to do something with the craft because so many films around the world, Britain, Soviet Union, Japan, stuff like that, they, Sweden, of course, with, you know, you've got all the the masters, quote unquote, the masters from there, were really able to push the envelope in a way where they weren't suppressed as much by the Hayes Code. And when it would come out of America, it would get suppressed, and that's why it was forgotten. But when they were making them in their home countries, they were able to do a lot more things. Um, so I think that's a really valid point, Ariel. So before I get into it, what is mod culture? What what is that supposed to be? So you know, you know, like the Who. Uh, yeah, those I fucking really hate kind of... them, but yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, but but for example, for in this her. movie, like um, they kind of like Mark's style essentially is like kind of like um, oh that winter coat kind of look. He he rides like a a scooter. It, it, ironically, in in recent history, in uh, the Book of Boba Fett, that 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 gang, that colorful gang, mm. you know those those are mods. I, I feel like those are, those are more like American graffiti. Like those are more American mods. Are like, Mod, like I see the, American graffiti is more so like uh, the American motorcycle. Where yeah, um, that's what I felt like. Mods are more. Guys. They 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 drove um, mods um, scooters. 
But they weren't. I, yeah, they I, weren't. Um. They weren't. Uh. Uh. Motorcycles. They were. They were scooters. Mod scooters. I don't know. I. I feel like. Yeah. It's the fantasy vehicles. I don't know. I feel like maybe. I don't. Know, to me, they felt more like American graffiti esque. Like I think the audience in. could. If correct, whichever one. But I'm pretty sure they they were influenced by mod, um, characters. I mean, I've heard a lot of people them. saying that it's. I mean, we're. This is like off topic, but like, I think like it was like a because George Lucas did American Graffiti. It was a callback to that. But Alan, did you ever watch Teen Titans? Uh, yeah, of course. Do you remember Mad Mod? Oh my God! Okay, so that's, is it like that's the, what mods are? Okay, so it's kind of like. I, I mean, I, I'm I'm probably wrong. It's not like Austin Powers kind of. Kind of. Somewhat. Somewhat. Not. Like, they got that. Yeah. A lot of times they have that bowl haircut. You know. That yeah, you see on, like Ringo Starr mm-hmm. or some shit. Uh, okay, so I I, I kind of have some familiar familiarity with it. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I I yeah. So, anyways, um, to get right into it, uh, I love the hell out of this movie, and I will say I kind of disagree a little bit that like he was a complete psychopath because his character reminded me a lot of like in psychology. There's a, I can't remember his name. But they kind of did a, an experiment on a kid where uh, they kind of conditioned him to be afraid of rabbits. Where they would, you know, that he was a baby and they would put, uh, I wonder if maybe they, they took the study and got, were influenced by the study and put it in, a, in the movie as kind of like his arc. Where they would put a rabbit near this little kid and then they, and like whenever he got near the rabbit, they would scare the shit out of him. They would make it like a really loud noise or something and it ended up conditioning him. To have like fear Pavlov, of rabbits. Pavlov kind of yeah, Pavlov's dog. dog kind of thing. Exactly. And so I kind of felt like his dad was kind of doing an experiment on him where I feel like at, at start at the start you do feel like you're like, damn, this guy's like a psychopath. But over time you get to know his story a little bit more and you're like, I feel like he's he's very sympathetic where I kind of feel very bad about it. And he was kind of planning his like suicide like over time in the film he's kind of bringing it up that he's like i know how this is going to end i don't want to tell you the the ending to my documentary when he tells the other uh filmmaker character uh when they're getting questioned by the police and i i thought that was really interesting that like at the end he didn't want to kill the the love interest he i her name escaped me but yeah like like even then he was like i i don't want to look at you because this whole thing for the audience is that he likes he he, he kind of loses control when the person right. is frightened when they're mm-hmm. scared so they're like so he kind of gets into that like killer mode kind of thing and he keeps mm-hmm. making her look away and like there is like heart to him like he he's not you know like a stone cold killer or something like which which i'm pretty sure these other films were probably influenced by this one like uh maniac uh the original on the remake and uh henry uh, portrait of a serial killer so those were like where the, the serial killers, like the main character, and you follow them around kind of thing. So I, I feel like this was way ahead of its time as well, like Derek was saying. But I felt like his character, I felt super bad for him. And like you could, and the thing is that, that Mark, the actor, just absolutely killed it. Mm-hmm. I love how he was so good at conveying this, like, you feel sympathetic and you feel so, like, not bad for him, but you're just kind of like, he's kind of adorable. He's kind of shy at everything. and, and like it seems like he wants to be around people and he wants to make friends, but he knows in the back of his mind that he has this like dark side to him and he didn't want it. It it wasn't like something he, he wanted to do. It's kind of like in psychology where like some people just get, unfortunately, I know there's going to be a little, you know, trigger warning, but unfortunately with like, you know, pedophiles, they, it's, it's usually comes from an abuser. So someone abused, that person as a kid and then they have kids and then they abuse their kid and they, and they do these horrible things to them and then that child kind of keeps the cycle going so you know I, i'm not trying to say like you know he's in that same aspect but I'm, I'm more saying like it's i didn't i felt bad for him like i actually kind of wanted him to be out alive and i wanted his love interest to like be able to pull pull him out of it like to to redeem him in some way but he's still a killer and he still did these horrible things because they're still pretty vindictive and, and disturbing to the sense. And I'm pretty sure audiences at the time were probably like, whoa, this is like horrible. And I think too, serial killers and like true crime stuff didn't really get into the 
into like the bigger picture until way later on you know he there's all these true crime podcasts and documentaries and stuff now and there are all these things that took place from like the 50s all the way to the 90s so for audiences back then that was probably truly frightening to think that somebody can follow you around with a camera and just stalk you and you know voyeurism was probably not really a something general audiences knew so i can see why like it probably bothered a lot of critics and audiences back in the day where they're just like this is fucked up like it was probably like just way too graphic for them and and i'm kind of glad though it has like a, a following and a cult and it's considered a cult classic because i feel like there's a lot to it like you guys were saying it's very ahead of its time and i feel like this is one of the big slasher influences it has to at this point because it it, it kind of has the same tropes and everything but I, it's funny that even though it's ahead of its time it kind of somehow gets around all the bullshit 80s kind of style where it's like summer camp and sex and all this stuff, you know, all the all the shitty fun slasher shit we love. But back then, I felt like they actually tried to make like a really great story that was dark and disturbing, but it was like, I felt like it was like a character study too at the same time. But again, like his character, the, the actor, he just portrayed him so well because you know what it was it's his eyes mm -hmm. you can see his smile and the way he yeah. talks that's what gets you feeling like you can be around him and, and you feel safe around him but his eyes tell even more that's where it's the complete like 50 50 like there's a good side to him and then there's a bad side but unfortunately like his eyes are the big tell that he's the darkness is still there and he just can't control it and you know, even and he tried to get help. He actually talked talk to the psychologist, which cracked, kind of made me laugh because uh, I feel like back then everybody thought like psychologists were German. <laughs> that was always the thing for some reason. So I was like, "Damn, I haven't seen that in a long time." So it was funny <laughs> seeing that. And um, yeah, he tried to at least get some help. He tried to take care of himself, and unfortunately, the psychologist was like, "Yeah, it's quick, dude. It'll take like three years." And uh, <laughs> The other day or some shit like that and he's like oh fuck like you could see in his face that he's like i don't have that time what if i hurt somebody else or what if i do something horrible again kind of thing but yeah that that dude killed it he 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 deserves to be up there uh, on that on that pedestal as much as like anthony perkins is with uh psycho and norman bates like i just i really love this movie i really dug it a lot i'm glad i finally got around to it but um yeah, like, uh, do you guys have any any other things you noticed that really caught your attention by it? I think for me, with you talking about that, and like, I think it's just like my yeah, it, it, the intuition kind of thing of like nowadays that sadly, you know, women like me have to have about these kind of guys. Where for me, I he's untrustworthy on site kind of thing. Um, but I could I could definitely see like the charm that he has, but mm -hmm. you know, for me being being taught and stuff like that, it's like no, that's something to to um you know, kind of like be on guard for. So so yeah. Like but it, I did definitely it he definitely has like yeah, like Dexter ish vibes, you know, and this yeah. he's he definitely is like a one for one almost of like Dexter and that voyeurism that that in the Dexter show kind of shows and, I, and maybe very that, much oh mm -hmm. sorry um I very much do agree with that aspect though because now any person who sees this movie nowadays are gonna be like what well, dude he's fucking staring at us we're having a party and he's just fucking there's, there's a dude there <laughs> like me and yeah. my girlfriend were watching and I immediately was like oh no 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 if some guy was peeking in I'd call the cops like this immediately yeah. or if it's a bunch of us guys we're like, let's go kick this dude's ass. Yeah. yeah. Also, he was drinking. He was offering her milk. That's a red flag. Anytime anybody oh, drinks milk in a fucking yes. movie, they're evil as shit. Yes, another. Yeah, absolutely. I even said the same thing. I was like, milk. <laughs> I was like, man, I love milk. I love chocolate milk. Why does it have to be like the devil's fucking <laughs> liquid right? and shit? I'm like, no. Why? Like, you know, a Clockwork Orange. You mm. know, the boys with Homelander. Uh, you know, yeah, would, uh, yeah. Inglorious Bastards, everything. You know, I'm like, why? Why does it have to be milk? But yeah, he's <laughs> like, I was like, you should just, all right, whatever. Yeah, at that point, I was like, okay, dude, yeah, you're pretty fucked up. You're, you're <laughs> you know, that that's that's what made me go, okay. You, you were sympathetic to me for a moment. You offered milk. You're you're fucking Satan. 
your ear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's why, like, for me, um, I, I just couldn't get past some things. And, like, I, it definitely is not a movie that could be believed and could be believable nowadays, definitely. Like, for example, like, her mother, his love interest mother, even though she, I, I, I'm pretty sure she, like, know, knew that he's hurt some, he's, like, not the greatest dude, but he, she's, like, willing to, like, just be careful and don't, don't hurt my daughter, kind of, it, essentially, that she's okay with it in a bit, or she's kind of just kind of crazy herself, too. I mean, you know, blind woman kind of thing. Um, Back then, that kind of trope of a... <laughs> but, but, yeah, like, it, it's just something that that's definitely, like somewhat unbelievable to me and like was was something that contributed to kind of taking me out of the the movie experience and stuff that that this woman would allow her daughter still like even though sensing danger from this man would still be like okay with her daughter kind of like going after him and 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 he did cut him off at a certain point though i will at least at least say that for her she cut she he cut himself off well, no, like, she's like, she's like, you, one she, of us she is going to leave. Yeah, yeah, she's like, she's like, you got to, she's like, we're going to move out of here if you talk to my daughter again, pretty much is what she said. Um, after she was like, creep, like, he almost murdered her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You Which know what? She, I don't think she knew, but yeah. I, I feel like the mom at first, I feel like the mom was like, weirdly enough, I feel like the mom wanted Helen. There you go. That's her name, Helen. To like get laid. I kept feeling <laughs> having this. I feel like the, I mean, obviously, there's like the pinup and the, the the nude photo shoots and shit. But I feel like throughout the movie, there was this underlying kind of like sexual nature mm -hmm. where you know, it, like when he killed the um, the stand-in who was like absolutely stunning. I, I I'm not gonna lie. I had a huge crush on her watching this movie. <laughs> she was super cute and her dance. I was like, oh my god, she's adorable. But anyways. Yeah, like even her, she I felt like, you know, they're they're kind of going backstage and they're going after hours and like all I could think about was like she wants to fuck. Like I'm like, she's probably <laughs> gonna fuck. And Mark is like, Oh no, 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 I have a completely different thing. And I felt like the mom in the beginning, she's like, I'm gonna finish my drink in five minutes. You should probably go up there and like talk to him. And I was like, You like trying to get your daughter laid? Like, you're really pushing that, but I feel like throughout the movie though the mom maybe because she's blind or something she, her her other senses got heightened and that woman's intuition just got even more heightened and the yeah. more she knew because she even says it herself she's like yeah i need information firsthand and i feel like she knew until like she uh, uh, until she finally um confronts him she's like yeah you're bad news mm -hmm. we, we can't be having this shit like i think she's the she was the one that was very level-headed and and no pun intended but saw between the lines kind of thing mm -hmm. so yeah yeah and then well, just one other thing because you are asking like if we had any other thoughts one other thing i was thinking of this movie and it's a cliche about the whole don't uh show don't tell but i think that this movie did that really well whereas you know you could have this whole exposition where he's like well see my dad used to throw lizards on me and stuff but it's like no this is a movie about a guy who's a filmmaker it's a film about a filmmaker so we're gonna show you that with like he shows you all these creepy videos from his childhood and you see that his dad has these voyeuristic tendencies and you get all of that info in a really neat way and then he kind of goes out and he talks about his dad being academic and then you see he's got like those like 18 volumes on like the nature of fear and he just kind of like taps it for a second and they comment on it a little but they don't they do more with the visual medium of film they're like we're going to show you these things we don't need to have like a chris nolan like expository huge paragraph of explaining why he's this way we can kind of give you these visual explanations uh, and I thought that was really well done. I agree with that a lot, too, because one of my favorite parts, uh, my girlfriend was kind of upset about it, but I thought it was fucking awesome, was that you don't see the victim's faces mm -hmm. after they're dead. Because there's the whole thing of, like, you know, they, they you know, the, the, the stand-in when she's in the box, you, they never show it, and, you know, it kind of makes the audience that they go, oh my god, her face is, you know, that's how she died. She died terrified and frightened. Or whatever, and I I love that aspect that they didn't show because again, less is more. Like you were saying, I, I in your head you kind of create the picture, and it's always more terrifying. 
th- than it really is. So yeah, that that's one of my big things that I loved about the less is more aspect. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, her her his uh his dad was kind of like a proto. Well, I don't know if Scarecrow appeared by then, but he was a he was a Jonathan Crane for sure, Scarecrow. Mm-hmm. You know, with all the books about fear, I was like, you might as well be the Batman <laughs> villain. You know, you're already doing scumbag shit to your kid, but yeah. So, Alan, I wanted to ask you, because you are like our resident horror film, slasher film expert, and this gets described, as we've touched on, as like a proto-slasher. How do you, like, do you think this was really influential on flashers, slashers, or how do you think it, it did kind of influence that genre? Absolutely. I think it really did. I think Psycho and, and this film, I think, you know, filmmakers who who got into it and, and probably started making slasher films the first in the scene 70s, of Halloween. 80s. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Halloween probably got that exactly that POV kind of type mm-hmm. of thing from it. You know, I mean, I, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, John Carpenter like saw it as a kid and was like, "Damn, that's a really cool scene," you know. And and now you know we have video games where you play as a serial killer, like Dead by Daylight, and and you know you stalk characters. And I believe I think it's first person. I don't know, but there's there's you're pretty much doing the same thing. But absolutely, I feel like it is a big inspiration because I feel like with the 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 um, slasher villains, there's always something to them, and you know they're almost kind of like superheroes in a way where they have something that you know that that you recognize. Like Thor, he has his hammer. You know, Batman. You know, he's dressed like a bat essentially, and um, you know you have the the, the villains where like Freddy Krueger has his costume and, and the burnt face and he has the, the claws a- and with Mark's character, that was his thing is the camera and the, and the, the, the knife at the end of the tripod where I was like, yeah, that's totally a slasher villain kind of thing. And just obviously the body count. I know this one had a very small body count compared to current slasher movies where they're just trying to fucking bump up the numbers as much as they can. Where I did appreciate that this one, it was like, I think at most three people were killed, but that's enough to be like, yeah. And I'm pretty sure people later on were like, yeah, I wanted, they were influenced by that to, you know, Friday the 13th, let's kill as many fucking teenagers as we can and make them as horrifying as they can. But yeah, obviously because of the time, they can't show gore and, and everything. I mean, there was like very minimal blood. I think like when Mark's character died, I think that was the only time you saw blood on his, um, you saw the blood on the blade, but it was so fucking minor. You can barely see it. But yeah, I, and I really liked, I feel like a lot of slashers though nowadays don't incorporate as much as a good story, like origin story. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, Freddy Krueger, but like those stories are meant to show like how horrible this character is. Oh, well, you know what? Jason Voorhees, you know, I was going to say he, like, yeah, Jason, Jason with his Voorhees. childhood trauma too. Exactly. So sometimes like even with Freddy versus Jason, they kind of made it seem where like, Jason was quote unquote like the lesser of the two evils. Like they're like, mm-hmm. we want him to kill Freddy Krueger because Freddy Krueger for sure is evil as fuck. And they even do like a lot of lighting with colors where Jason has a lot of blues and Freddy has a lot of red. And yeah, like even he, when the characters hear the story of Jason Voorhees are kind of like, well, he doesn't seem that bad. Poor guy was fucking traumatized and just died in the lake and stuff. So yeah, damn, like. The more I think about it, yeah, there's just huge influences. Absolutely, yeah. But this one, for sure, I feel like deserves a lot more recognition. And I'm pretty sure the horror community like knows about it, but I hope like more current people that are getting into the genre can go out and see this movie and, and truly appreciate it for what it is. And that just reminds me, too, like, you know, the whole voyeuristic thing. And, you know, it is touched on here, but I think that later slasher films would take that to the next level. Because you always hear, like, the slasher movies, it's always pe- like don't have sex in a slasher movie because Jason or Freddy or whoever will kill. It's something they even comment on in like Cabin in the Woods. Like it's become such a trope. And I wonder if you can really trace that back to here with him being like, "Ooh, look at these people." You know, he doesn't murder anybody, but he is like kind of like drawn to them in that that very voyeuristic peeping Tom esque way. Yeah, and the same thing uh, with like. Uh, kind of the sex thing. I know nobody really had sex in this movie, but like uh, one of the models, the pinup models, she was very kind of oozing sex appeal and everything. And mm-hmm. a lot of current, you know, slashers from the 80s, 
a lot of the characters that were like kind of oozing that kind of like sexual appeal were the ones that ended up getting murdered. And I don't know. There, there's something about like characters that like have sex or they get naked or whatever the fuck do drugs and drink and everything. There's just something about it. It's kind of like a punishment almost where like mm-hmm. the villain, the slasher villain is going out of the way to be like, you're doing these horrible things. And even though they're not horrible, but like, it's their way of like, you know, you need to pay for your sins of, you know, doing this, just how Jason, same thing. His mom in the original was like, I'm going to kill you fuckers because fornicators, because fornicators. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like they, they, they fucking were supposed to be taking care of this, this child. And they're like, now nah, let's go fuck kind of thing so it's like pay for what you've done and i think in a way mark kind of did that in this in a sense with the the pinup model where he was like you do these things even though he's there taking the photos which is kind of hypocritical but yeah i feel like in that sense that he's like i I need to kill you i guess like i felt like he needed that Mm -hmm. yeah definitely but yeah ultimately um do you guys, would you guys want to recommend this to anybody, or would you feel like you're kind of like, ah, eh, you know, like, I feel like it's pretty underrated for sure. Uh, I really hope people go out there and watch it and check it out. Uh, I mean, it's, I, I honestly, yeah, it still blows me away how, for me personally, I thought it was really great. But, Ariel, um, what do you think? Like, do you feel like you might need another watch, or you're like, nah, I'm good? Uh, I'm, I'm definitely okay. Um, uh, but, it's it's if you're looking for that kind of like I guess kind of scene where possibly things had inspiration from I w- I would recommend it, but if you know I think I think um if you are if you like Psycho then then probably check this one out if you want like a more or even like Dexter if you want kind of like a more direct version of those kind of two two characters then then definitely. Then check this one out, and yeah, it definitely is a movie of its time, in the way that that if a believability, I could, I guess you can say, it's it's kind of like yeah, like a a psychological kind of thriller and and case study of essentially of 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 a killer that you know wants to be caught and like has what's that word story laid out and that's how it's gonna go kind of thing so yeah if you you are into those kind of thrillers then definitely yeah then check this one out yeah i mean i would absolutely recommend this movie i like i said before this didn't really know it um and it was you know brought to my attention and i'm so glad because as i've mentioned before on this series and part the big reason i wanted to do this vintage collection series is that i sometimes have a harder time with older movies uh, because it was they were made so differently it was such a different time and finding things like this that really connect with me um has been a mission for this and this one definitely hit and i think that it will connect with a lot of other people too uh so yeah of a lot of the things that i've watched for this this and then of course also our last week's pick the uninvited i would really recommend both of them to if you are like me and you want to look at some older films that are not going to be, like, on the AFI 100 list or, like, you know, Roger Ebert's great movies or ones that are a little more kind of beneath the surface. This is a really great one for that. Sweet, yeah. Well, no, thank you guys for for watching. I hope you guys out there give it a shot. I mean, the Halloween season's coming right up, so if you're in that mood for, like, an old type of movie that you're like, hey, you know what, I don't want to watch Halloween, I want to go even further back, well, there you go. Um, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and now our plugs. Yeah, um, I host a podcast that comes out every first of the month called um, You've Never Seen, where I discuss a film that either myself or my guest has never seen, um, but is considered a part of pop culture and cinematic history. The most recent one as of this recording was uh, Harry Potter, which was a pretty fun one for me to do. Very much enjoyed it and talking about it uh, i could always talk about harry potter so yeah nice yeah and then i do a couple other podcasts as well i've got gateway episodes which is going to be coming out with season two pretty soon um we're waiting to hit a patreon goal and i'm finishing recording 
the last couple episodes, uh, so I'm having a lot of fun with that. That's a, where we watch a single episode of a TV show and decide if we want to step through the gateway and get into the show. I also co-host, speaking of Damien, who recommended this, I do co-host uh, his podcast, uh, Can I Say Something? Have a lot of fun with that. And then whenever there's a new Marvel thing, I also do Infinity Stones and Dragon Bones, which is our MCU podcast. And then, speaking of Patreon, we also do, every once in a while, a exclusive episode for our Undercast Film Club. So if you are a patron, you get to hear that. We're going to be talking about, I'm not sure if it's going to be out by the time this episode drops, uh, the kind of summer movie recap. So looking at a lot of the movies that came out this past summer season. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. So if you you know have a li- as little as a dollar to spare, just one dollar a month for our Patreon, uh, Patreon um, and we'd love to have you. And we've got our Discord, and you can check that out. Uh, follow us on all the socials, Undercast Company everywhere. Um, and we'd love to hear from you, get any episode suggestions, because we, uh, we will sometimes cover them. We like to hear what you guys want us to cover, and we will uh, maybe talk about it. So let us know. Yeah, check out that Patreon. I'm, I'm in the process of, of developing kind of like a solo essay kind of series for the patro- patrons um, that I'm getting very excited for. So um, it's in the early works, but a little bit of like a TED Talk kind of nerd talk kind of thing that doing a solo episodes on every once in a while so, yeah. and I just want to mention I am guesting on a lot of other podcasts that I've been having a really fun time with some I am very very excited for you guys to hear so definitely check all of those out the one that I'm on that actually drops today so you guys should just go listen to it right now is I was on the cozy Christmas podcast talking about the top 5 underrated Christmas movies I had a ton of fun being on that so go ahead and check that out. The link to that is just going to be in the description uh, for the episode. So definitely give that a click. Cool, cool. And yeah, uh, look out for the next Infinity Stones and Dragon Bones, where we're going to do a three-hour episode about She-Hulk and Meg the Stallion twerking. So look out for that. <laughs> Hope you guys like it. <laughs> just kidding. But yeah, right, thanks. <laughs> thank you thanks so much, everybody. everybody. <laughs> thanks for being amazing, everybody. Good night. Take it easy, everybody.